Good morning. Welcome to Cedars Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Jenny Weaver, and I'm the worship associate today for our service alongside our minister, Reverend Zachary Vinson. Before we start, let's pause to acknowledge that members of our congregation occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Coast Salish tribes. The homelands of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Clallam, and Chimicum people were ceded under duress through the Point Elliot and Point No Point treaties. We are grateful guests on these lands and affirm indigenous sovereignty both past and present. This acknowledgement does not substitute for the need to build authentic relationships with modern day members of these tribes and to learn about their living culture and history. Our faith community is sustained by the generosity of our members. Your contribution will nourish the spiritual growth of our community through weekly worship, ongoing programs that cultivate connection, belonging, sharing, and caring. Included in the video description and displayed on the screen is information to make a contribution to Cedars through our PayPal account. Please take time either now or later in the service to make a contribution to help sustain Cedars. Your gifts are greatly appreciated. Cedars is committed to being a welcoming and inclusive community. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, and skin tones that come together in your uniqueness, we welcome you. In all the ways you experience and express gender in the beauty of who and how you love, we welcome you. With all the religious and ethical traditions that inform your spiritual life, we welcome you. You are invited to join us today and always with an open mind, a loving heart, and willing hands. While I was thinking about the topic of today's sermon, what is true for you, I spent some time thinking and I allowed a picture to form in my mind. What is true for you may not be true for someone else. I thought of the exercise in perspective in which a group of people sit in a circle around a stone and draw what they see. Then they compare their view of the stone and reflect on others' perspectives. Each drawing is true to the person who sat at that particular spot and drew what they saw. And yet someone who sat across the circle would see something completely different. That person who sat across from you drew from their perspective and it is not right or wrong, but part of the whole. This exercise does not fully translate perfectly in every situation, however. For example, debating the validity of the science that backs climate change with someone who believes that these changes are part of the natural cycle of the earth is not the same thing as viewing one stone from two sides. Yet even so, it is an important lesson. This week, while I was at one of my nursing clinical classes, I found myself in a discussion or listening to a discussion with two people who believe that COVID-19 was manufactured in a lab and that the vaccine will kill more people than the disease. What I have read about the science of COVID-19 has led me to a different opinion, and I spent several moments applauding myself for my correct interpretation of the science of the pandemic. But when I think about it, the lesson of perspective is still applicable. I have a different perspective. I read different news sources. I have access to different information and I have different beliefs. And even if I don't argue, even if I don't agree with others' conclusions, I must still recognize that their perspective has led them to their interpretation of what they see. So with that thought, I dedicate the lighting of the chalice to the challenge of being aware of the influence of perspective in our own beliefs. As we come together to worship, we remind ourselves to treat all people kindly because we are one family, to take good care of the earth because it is our home, and to live lives of love and goodness because that is how we will all become the best that we can be. Come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of living, ours is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come, come. Whoever you're leaving, God is my 
Before our call to worship, I want to just thank everyone who showed up at our day of service at West Sound Wildlife Shelter this last Sunday. There were 42 people who joined together to weed and garden and to learn about some of the native wildlife in our area, as well as the work that the wildlife shelter is doing to rehabilitate and preserve uh, some of these animals. Also, just a reminder to everyone that this Sunday, May 2nd at 12 p.m. in the Sage parking lot, so across from the Island School, the Committee on Ministry is going to be hosting an in-person social hour. This is a chance for us to reconnect and socialize a little bit, as well as for the Committee on Ministry to talk with all of you about what their role is in the community and to begin uh, to begin doing that work together. And so if you're able to join, I hope that you will join us from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. at the Sage parking lot. And also as an added bonus, Catherine J., our faith formation lead, will be with us. So this will be a chance for many of you to meet Catherine for the first time in person. I look forward to seeing you all there. Our call to worship today is reading number 434 in the back of our gray hymnal. And this reading comes from an anonymous source, but I still want to share it with all of you this morning. As we come together, may we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, to each other. Come, let us worship together. tell you a story today called The Leaky Pot. And The Leaky Pot is about a young girl and her work for her village. So this village is situated at the very top of a tall mountain. And to get water every day, this little girl walks down the mountain until she comes to the stream and she takes her two pots and she fills them up and then she walks back up to her village at the top of the mountain. She does this happily. She does this singing on the way down and singing on the way up. She enjoys her work. And one of the pots that she uses also really enjoys the work. This pot is perfect. It's always on her left side. It has no cracks, no blemishes. And when the little girl fills up the pot, it stays full all the way back up to the top of the mountain. This pot feels very 
very good about itself. And sometimes, not in a mean way, not cruel, it lets the other pot know how perfect it is. Because see, the other pot is not perfect. The other pot has a slow leak. It's not a big crack, but it's just enough of a crack that by the time the little girl gets back to the top of the mountain, the pot is only about half full. And this pot, this pot does not feel good about itself every day. It feels kind of worthless. Compared to the other pot, which is perfect and brings up all of the water, this pot only brings up half of the water. And so every day the two pots compare, and every day the pot that only brings half feels a little worse and worse and worse and worse about itself. I'm pointless. I don't even know why I exist. Why doesn't she replace me and get a new pot that will hold all of the water? I can't do my job. The other pot doesn't say anything, but kind of agrees. Anyway, one day the little girl stops singing long enough to kind of hear out of the corner of her ear. Do ears have corners? Anyway, she overhears the pots talking. And she hears how sad and upset the cracked pot is. And she says, do you think I didn't notice that you were cracked? Of course I noticed. You are perfect just as you are. And the pots, both of them are thinking, how can that be? How can a pot be perfect if it's cracked? Pots are supposed to be whole and carry water. And the little girl says, have you ever noticed the path up the mountain where the leaky pot is? Both pots would shake their heads if they had heads. But they in fact have not noticed because they've just been talking to each other and comparing notes about which one is more perfect. And the little girl says, on the way up today, notice the path. And so the pots do. And what do you think they see? On the path, on the side that has the leaky pot, are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of flowers. Hmm, I wonder why that is, think the pots. They're not that smart, being pots. And the little girl says, I realized you had a slow leak right when I started this job. And so I sprinkled seeds up that side of the mountain. And every day with your slow leak, you water the seeds. And now, not only do I bring water to the village, I bring beautiful flowers to the village. And that makes everyone happy. So both of you pots are perfect just the way you are. You unblemished pot with no cracks, you supply most of the water. And the cracked pot, well, you bring some water and you also bring beautiful flowers. So each one of you is absolutely perfect the way you are. And that is my story. For our spiritual moment today, I invite you to join me in a moment of reflection with these words by Reverend Leslie Takahashi. They teach us to read in black and white. Truth is this, the rest false. You are whole or broken. Who you love is acceptable or not. Life tells its truth in many hues. We are taught to think in either or. To believe in the teachings of Jesus or Buddha. To believe in human potential or a power beyond a single will. 
Am I broken? Or am I powerful? Life embraces multiple truths, speaks of both and. We are taught to see in absolutes good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight. Let us see the fractions, the spectrum, the margins. Let us open our hearts to the complexity of our worlds. Let us make our lives sanctuaries to nurture our many identities. The day is coming when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than the monochromatic, uh, that the river of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, that the margins hold the center. May it be so. Amen.
Perhaps at some point in your life, you've seen one of those pictures where the image can look like multiple things. An outline of a vase or some sort of fancy chalice-like cup, or two people preparing to kiss. An image of a duck, or if you turn it the other way, a rabbit. Or similarly, a picture of a certain dress that made the rounds on the internet a few years ago. A dress that caused many people to wonder, is it blue and black or white and gold? Debates over such images have raged on in Psychology 101 classes and among friends for years. And yet, some people are convinced, no matter how much the point is argued, that what they see is right, and the other options are just plain wrong. These sort of visual illusions can be fun, but also point to the fact that each of us sees things quite differently from other people in our lives. Such optical mix-ups are often the result of something that is called ambiguous images and are a phenomena caused by a variety of things, actually. The orientation of an image, a break in the lines or the outline, a funny texture or shading on the picture, or multiple implied points of focus. All of these factors can cause our brains to get confused and start trying to fill in details in an attempt to make sense of what it is we are seeing. In a sense, when things don't make sense, our mind tries to find a way to fill those gaps so we can understand what is happening in the world around us, even if what we are seeing isn't actually there. This difference in perception versus reality isn't only an optical illusion confined to pictures, however. There are many times in lives, in our lives, where multiple people can look at the same situation and come away with a radically different perspective on what is happening. The story that Catherine shared earlier in our service about the two pots and the girl carrying water in them is an example of such a situation. On first examination, the cracked pot that the young girl is carrying is seen as being deficit, that somehow this pot is inferior compared to the pot without a crack in it. The pot with a crack in it leaks water, and as a result is seen by itself, in this story at least, as somehow being of less value than the pot without a crack. And yet, after years of the little girl walking along the same path with the cracked pot, the true value of the cracked pot is revealed. It turns out, the whole time, this pot was actually just a duck. Just kidding. The true worth of the pot is revealed when we learn of the flowers and other plants that had been watered along the path as the little girl carried it. Yes, the water that the pot, the cracked pot carried, didn't all make it back to the village to provide water for cooking or sanitation. And yet still, in its crackedness, it sustained life in another way. Again, proving that the first perception of something is not always the truth. It's like the Reynold Niebuhr quote I referenced in last Sunday's service. In this quote, Niebuhr says, nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. In this case, 
It's the faith of the little girl carrying the pot day by day. The faith that though not all the water makes it back to the village, there is still value in carrying the leaky pot all of those trips, even when that value can't be perceived in the immediate context of history. Nyberg goes on adding that no virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. For me, this second part of the quote speaks to the fact that speaks of the fact that speaks to the fact that because the pot, dress, or other such examples we have considered can be perceived in different ways by different people, that we must remain open to acknowledging new perspectives and be willing to admit when we are wrong, or, as sometimes is harder, that others are right. This is perhaps why Niebuhr names forgiveness as the final form of love. It's because it's the kind of love that calls us to admit we aren't always right, and in admitting this, still seek to remain in relationship with both friend and foe. Thinking of how these various perspectives can be held about the same image, situation, or even person, I'm reminded of something that Robert Shore Goss writes about queer theory. They say that queer theory destabilizes essential notions of sexuality, identity, and gender. It renders fluid these cultural concepts and practices once considered stable. In a sense, queer theory invites us to call into question previously held perspectives and truths. When applied to the area of theology, British scholar Jeremy Carrot says that in the queer space of theology, we find ambiguity and not knowing. It is this embrace of uncertainty that underpins the spiritual framework of LGBTQ folks in the United States. It's an uncertainty born out of queer folks being excluded from family, faith communities, and other places in our society. An unknowing that grew out of the countless lives that were lost during the 1980s AIDS crisis, born of uncertainty about whether or not our relationships would be legally or socially recognized. These circumstances have converged in the queer community and given rise to a unique perspective that allows room for a multiplicity of understandings. This both and approach creates a container in which the traditional understanding of life can be challenged and from this challenging expand the limits of what is accepted. Queer theology is an attempt to open up an ongoing exploration or dialogue rather than making declarative statements about what is or is not. From this perspective, right and wrong fall by the wayside, and our sense of wonder is engaged. We're invited to question. The queer perspective on culture and theology creates a space in which the seemingly broken clay pot is still seen as valuable, a perspective where the image is both a rabbit and a duck at the same time. When I think of this understanding of queer theology and the expansiveness that it invites us into, I'm reminded of a poem by the poet Jalal Adin Muhammad Rumi, in which he writes, 
out beyond the idea of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. Out beyond the idea of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Isn't this the idea or goal that we as Unitarian Universalists strive for? To meet in some field, in some place, a beloved community where there is room enough for everyone, where everyone is embraced for the fullness of who they are without being judged for their differences or perceived brokenness. To live in a world where life embraces multiple truths speaks of both and. Where we are taught to see not in absolutes, good versus evil, male versus female, old versus young, gay versus straight, but instead to see worth in all things encompassed by creation, to encompass all things in our understanding of worth and dignity, to set aside our judgments and embrace the web of life with as much love as we can possibly muster. So most weeks when I preach, though not explicitly stated, this is the perspective I am preaching from, from a perspective informed by my queer identity, a perspective that encourages all of us to hold others in compassion and worth even when you see a duck and they see a rabbit, to see value in the cracked pot when we ourselves feel more capable of carrying our full volume and measure of water, to still see the gifts that are present in that other pot. This religious perspective runs counter to the orthodoxy of organized religion, and yet, despite this, is still a value of a valid form of theology by virtue of the lived experiences that have brought this view into the world. The experiences of queer folks who have been in the margins of society and sought to bring the wisdom they have gained from those margins into the center. This, perspective, this is the perspective from which I seek to minister to this congregation and to the world around me. And the truth is, from my point of view, as a white, cisgendered, gay man, I must still acknowledge that my experience of marginalization is much less severe than that of black trans women, for example, or disabled queer folks, or any number of other people who don't benefit from the privilege that I have as a cisgendered white man. Knowing this, and knowing how hard my own journey has been, as well as knowing how hard many of your own journeys have been, I have to pause, and in that pause, am forced to speculate a bit as to just how much more challenging the lives of those who don't share those privileged identities that I do are. Again and again, when I say that we have work to do, or that our work is not done yet, I say it often, just about every week I remind us there's still more to do. This is the place from which that statement flows. These statements flow from an acknowledgement that our inability to move beyond the binary way of viewing things still leaves many people 
out of the tent of faith that we call Unitarian Universalism, out of all of those privileges that we have benefited from. By not moving beyond our binary way of right and wrong, male and female, old and young, we continue to limit ourselves, to limit our possibilities and exclude those who are perhaps in most need of the hope that our faith has to offer. And that is why I pray with the words from Leslie Takahashi. I pray that there will come a day when all will know that the rainbow world is more gorgeous than the monochrome, that a river of identities can ebb and flow over the static, stubborn rocks in its course, that the margins hold the center to the glory of life. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. In closing, I leave you with these words by Michael A. Schuler. Cherish your doubts, for doubt is the servant of truth. Question your convictions, for beliefs too tightly held strangle the mind and its natural wisdom. Suspect all certitudes, for the world whirls on, nothing abides. Yet in our inner room full of doubt, inquiry, and suspicion, let a corner be reserved for trust. For without trust, there is no space for communities to gather or for friendships to be forged. Indeed, this is the small corner where we connect and reconnect with each other. Our service has ended, but our service to the world and one another begins anew. Go forth in a commitment to continue to question and search for what is true for each of us and to find a truth that is full of love and encompasses all. May it be so.